Good morning. Well, back in December of 2010, the cover story of Christianity Today magazine had a very intriguing title. It said, Jesus versus Paul. The biblical scholar Scott McKnight had written this article in which he tackled an issue that, uh, frankly, had sort of been lurking around Christianity for several centuries. Uh, The fact, the undeniable fact that much of what Jesus focuses on in the Gospels really has very little in common with the teachings of the Apostle Paul. Paul's primary focus and really his greatest contribution to Christianity are his writings about justification by faith. He writes about that a good deal in his epistles. Whereas Jesus, on the other hand, preach primarily about the kingdom of God and how we live as citizens of God's kingdom. And as McKnight pointed out in this article in Christianity Today, he said he, like uh, so many Christians over the past several hundred years, particularly Protestant Christians in America, Protestant evangelical Christians, have actually relied more on Paul than they have on Jesus to get their theology, to get their understanding of God. And as I was reading this week uh, Diana Butler Bass's chapter uh, from Freeing Jesus making, as we make our way through her book study, it took me back to this article from Christianity Today that I read you know, a dozen or so years ago because it felt like Diana Butler Bass was describing her own Jesus versus Paul moment as she was writing this chapter. That is to say that as Bass was growing and maturing in her, in her faith, she began to see this new identity of Jesus take form in her life. She went from hearing Jesus not only through the voice of Paul, but she was also able to hear Jesus speaking to her himself. As one of uh, her fellow college students told her when she was young, he said, Jesus can't just be your Savior. He must also be your Lord. I was riveted by that idea, she wrote in the book. Jesus, my Lord, my Master, a God who cared about justice and peace, Things that happened here on earth, she wrote. The Jesus I had encountered as a teenager, she said, could save people from sin and death. That would be sort of Paul's Jesus. But maybe there was more, she wrote. Maybe Jesus could save the world as Lord. Now, calling Jesus Lord is not unusual for us. We do it all the time today. It's just very normal But it would have been uh, a strong statement for people to do a couple of thousand years ago. It would have been a political statement to say Jesus is Lord. In fact, it's still a political statement in some places around the world. As Bass points out in her book, in ancient days, Lord was just a common word really to, to refer to somebody who is your superior, somebody who has authority or power over you, so if you were a servant, your, your master was your Lord. If you were uh, an apprentice, uh, the mentor, your mentor was your Lord. If you lived in the Roman Empire, the emperor was your Lord. And so, when these early Christian followers professed, Jesus is Lord, That was a a political affirmation, but not just that. It was more than that. It was an unpatriotic statement. Because as Bass points out, saying Jesus is Lord also means that Caesar is not. Therefore, we learn pretty early on in Christian history who it is that's most threatened by Jesus. It's people who are in power those who have power over others. 
Because the disciple of Jesus is going to be most inclined to, to do what Jesus says do and to go where Jesus says go and to live as Jesus says to live. And of course, what we know from Scripture is that Jesus calls his followers to, to go and to do and to live much differently than the Caesars of the world. And Scripture shows us this. And today's Scripture does as well. Today's passage that we just heard a moment ago actually comes from a section uh, in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 6. This it, kind of the larger section that this comes from, our, our reading today comes from, is known as the Sermon on the Plain. P L A I N. As I said in the 8 o'clock service, it would have been really interesting if it was P-L-A-N-E. <laughs> the Sermon on the Plain is, is similar to the Sermon on the Mount, which we're probably more familiar with from Matthew's Gospel. Sermon on the Plain is a little shorter, not quite as long. Jesus says many of the same things in the Sermon on the Plain. And when you read the Sermon on the Plain, it's, uh, it helps us see why so many people, particularly people of power, would have been a little freaked out, a little intimidated by Jesus, specific, specifically when people said Jesus is Lord. Because Jesus is defining in this sermon a kingdom that is so different, it's so diametrically opposed to the power structures that the Caesars of the world have set up. Structures, really, that we are used to living in. For instance, in his sermon, Jesus describes who he says is blessed. Blessed are the poor, he says. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the downcast. But woe to the rich. Woe to the powerful. Woe to the popular. The very ones that we lift up and put on a pedestal. Jesus says, woe to them. God's kingdom is different. Jesus is helping us see. In the kingdom of God, he says, we love our enemy in the Sermon on the Plain. In God's kingdom, we do good to those who hate us. We pray for those who mistreat us. In the kingdom, we don't retaliate when we're harmed. We give to those who ask, and we don't expect anything in return. In God's kingdom, we, we don't judge, we don't condemn people despite what they may have done to us. We forgive. This is God's kingdom. Despite what we have been led to believe, when Jesus describes the kingdom, and David talked about this a little bit last week too, when Jesus describes the kingdom, he's not simply talking about a heavenly home where we go to live in the sweet by and by after we die. He's talking about now. He's talking about our time on earth, his time on earth, our time right now. February 2023. Remember his disciples had asked him, Lord, teach us how to pray. We don't know how to pray. And, and Jesus said, pray like this. Father, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' prayers really were never that, that God would, would take us out of this world. Really, his prayers were that God's kingdom would come to us. And when Jesus is not just our Savior, but also our Lord, he will rule in our lives. And he'll move us to do that very thing, to bring God's kingdom on earth. And we can see God's kingdom. This is what's so wonderful. We can see God's kingdom when it's among us. It's not a mystery what it looks like. It's visible to the human eye. Jesus tells us this in the scripture we heard a moment ago. Jesus said, each tree is known by its fruit. No good tree will bear bad fruit. Likewise, a bad tree will not bear good fruit. So, when we love our enemy... We see the kingdom. Not only do we see the kingdom, but other people see the kingdom. And they're not used to seeing that, so they pay attention to that. That's what the kingdom looks like, loving your enemy. 
when we forgive, when we show mercy rather than judge and condemn, God's kingdom is there, and the world sees that. When we welcome the stranger, when we tear down walls that separate us, God's reign is present, and it's visible to others. Bass writes about that in her book. She said, again, as her faith matured, she said, quote, it was no longer enough that Jesus would save us from the world. We wanted Jesus to fix it. And what she helps us see in this chapter is that the world gets fixed, so to speak, when the people who call Jesus Lord, us, you and me, when we, when we begin to follow him as Lord and live out our faith. Jesus talked about this himself many times. He told stories, parables about people who, who would profess him as Lord and, uh, but then not always live the words that they profess. You may remember some of those stories that he told. For instance, he told the story of the, the two sons whose father told them to, uh, to go out and work in my vineyard. When the father told them to go work in the vineyard, the first son said no. But then he changed his mind and he went out and worked. When the father told the second son to go work in the vineyard, the second son said, yes, Father, I will go. But then he never went. And then Jesus, after he tells the parable, he asks the question, which son did the will of his father? And it was not the one who answered correctly. It was the one who worked, who did the work. Likewise, you know, one of the best-known parables in the entire Bible, the parable of the Good Samaritan, tells a very similar story. Remember, in that parable, we have all of these uh, very religious, good religious people, people who know all the right answers. They know how to answer all the questions. And these are the very ones who pass by uh, the man who is left dying in a ditch and do nothing to help him. Whereas the non-religious Samaritan is the one who stops and helps and saves his life. It's the non-religious person who does the will of God. The point of it all is that the real Lord of our lives is not necessarily the one we pay homage to with our words. It's who we serve by our acts and our deeds. Our Lord is the one who, at, who has our allegiance, our ultimate allegiance. Our Lord is the one who has authority over our decision-making, over where we go, over how we spend our time and our money, where and who we give our attention to. Jesus asked in our scripture today, he said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and yet do not do what I tell you? Isn't it interesting the way he, he words that? It would seem more natural for him just to say, why do you call me Lord and don't do what I say? But he doesn't say that. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord? He says it twice. I'm sure what he's doing there is he's, he's apparently talking to those folks. He's referring to those very religious people, again, who know the right words to say. They're used to praying that way, but they're not living out their words. Those folks, Jesus says, are like people who build their house on sand without a firm foundation so that when the storms of life come, their, their house or their faith collapses because they've been following the wrong Lord. But, he says, the one who hears my words and acts on them, the one who is a doer of my word, they're like one who dug deep into the foundation of the rock and their house, their faith will withstand whatever comes because their faith has been well constructed. Well, I saw this week yet another article. I hate to even look at religious publications because every time I look at them there's another article about the decline of the church and I saw another one this week 
about the decline of the church in America. This one was specifically about how Christianity is aging in the United States and particularly how so few young Americans are attending church anymore. The really sad part was that uh, the United Methodist Church was the second oldest church in the United States, second oldest denomination. So I was kind of sad when I was reading that. But I did find it a little serendipitous that I was looking at this information, reading that chart, the same week that I was reading in both uh, our book study and also in the Bible about Jesus as Lord. Because it made me wonder how those two might be connected. In other words, maybe young people aren't in church as much these days precisely because they don't see the kingdom. They're not seeing the kingdom as Jesus said they should. They're not seeing it in the church. They're not seeing it in us. They're not seeing it anywhere. They probably hear church folks talking about the Lord, but are they seeing evidence that we're bringing the kingdom on earth? Are they seeing evidence that we're doers of his word? Do they see us loving our enemy? Do they see us forgiving one another? Do they see us not condemning and not judging? Do they see us turning the other cheek rather than retaliating? Do they see us welcoming strangers? Do they see us giving to those who ask? Do they see the kingdom? We're going to pray in just a few moments, and uh, hopefully you'll pray some during the week as well. And when we pray, we will call Jesus Lord, because that's just what we do these days. It's normal for us to do that. My hope is that, as we've learned from Jesus today, that our actions, the way we live, the way we love, the way we care for one another, the way we care for God's creation, that all reflect the life of the one that we call Lord. Amen.